Welcome back to Mentor Nation, the podcast for entrepreneurs looking for real mentorship, real strategies, and real stories so that you can go out and build your dreams. I'm your host, John Abbas, and it's time for another episode, so buckle your seatbelt and let's go. Hey guys, and welcome back to the Mentor Nation podcast. John Abbas here in beautiful but actually snowy Nashville. We got our first snow today, which is exciting, but it's already mostly melted, unfortunately. I hope you guys are doing amazing, and I just am really excited about today's episode. As a lot of you may know, I am a huge advocate of the power of mentorship and just hands-on learning in general. One of my strongest beliefs for a very long time is that our current education system is in need of a major overhaul. Things are changing so fast and information is becoming outdated and irrelevant at an alarming rate, which is why I feel that children, especially today, need to be taught early on more real world skills like how to think and not just what to think. They need to learn things like how to solve real world problems, critical thinking skills, and how to overcome obstacles, especially challenging obstacles. And the problem in my opinion, is much of what is taught today is the same information from decades ago. This is why I'm especially excited to introduce you to today's guest, Laura Sandifer. Laura is the founder of Acton Schools. I actually stumbled on Acton by accident while listening to a podcast where a very, very successful entrepreneur and somebody that I really look up to was talking about sending his young kids there and how it was the greatest decision that he had ever made as a parent. Having three children myself, I immediately got on Google, and I looked them up, and I was just really blown away by what I saw. I reached out to the CEO on LinkedIn, and here we are having this awesome interview today. Acton is turning education upside down by focusing on a completely different model of teaching. As you'll see in this interview, she touches on things that, as a parent, gave me so much faith in their mission. And I want you just to imagine for a minute, imagine sending your child to a school that teaches them how to figure out what their passion is, a school that has exercises to help them develop their own inner genius and unique abilities. They have quests to teach them how to solve real-world problems, and most importantly, a method for instilling in them a mindset and a framework for overcoming challenging obstacles and getting back up when they fail or get knocked down. Acton does just that. In fact, they do it so well that they are growing like wildfire, having gone from just one experimental school in Laura's living room to over 250 schools worldwide in just a few short years. They are paving the way for what I believe could be one of the most important advancements in learning in a very long time. Me and Laura take a deep dive into the story of Acton, the mission, how it works, and what you can expect if you were to enroll your children. I hope you enjoyed this incredible episode. And without further ado, here is Laura Sanderford. All right, Laura, thank you so much for being on the Mentor Nation podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be with you, John. Yeah, absolutely. I have been looking forward to this interview for a very long time. And for the audience listening, guys, if you are parents, if you ever tend to become parents one day, I really, really hope that you will listen to this interview and you will absorb it. Before we get started, Laura, I just want to share a quick story, if you don't mind, on just kind of how I found you and why I was just so adamant to reach out to you. So I think that you probably know this and everybody listening probably knows this, especially entrepreneurs. You know, as, as time goes on, as we start families, I have three kids. You know, every now and then I find myself on Google and, you know, I'm always just looking for things like silly things like, you know, where does Elon Musk send his kids to go to school? Where does Bill Gates and his kids? And, you know, we, we're all familiar with like the Ivy League schools, Stanford, Harvard. But, you know, my interest, especially having an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 3-year-old is, you know, are there schools out there that are like Stanford but for younger age groups where kids can learn like how to think and really cool skills, things that, you know, we don't see in public schools. And I'll never forget, I was listening to another podcast to research a guest for my podcast. And the host, somehow they got into the conversation of schools 
his name was Hal Elrod, which I'm sure you know. And he was just like, oh my gosh, yeah, I send my kids to act in schools. And I'm like, what is that? And in the interview, he was talking about how it was the greatest thing that he's ever done. I mean, you know, Hal's a best-selling author. He's a big entrepreneur. And he just could not stop talking about your schools. And so that led me down a path of research. And I'm like, what is acting? And everything I found was just so amazing. So I just first off want to say it's just exciting to have you on. Thank you for responding. And I just can't wait to get into this interview. Well, thanks. I'm excited too. And Hal Elrod is one of my heroes as well. So it's fun that we have that connection together. Oh, that's awesome. And you went to Vandy. That's awesome. Yes, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So could you start, please, by just sharing with everybody, you know, what is act in schools? And we'll get into a little more after that. It's a great question. I think the, the simplest way to picture what act in academy is, if you think of a one room schoolhouse, but for the 21st century. So basically mm -hmm. what we did is we combined the very, very old with the very, very new to create a learning environment where our own children would be fully prepared to do really hard, big things in their futures because the schools we went to back in the day, those big traditional public schools we went to, did not seem to fit what our own children would be facing in terms of their need to be innovative and problem solvers and to be entrepreneurial. So when you picture that one room schoolhouse for the 21st century, mm -hmm. it's one room of mixed ages. So there's no grade levels at an Acton Academy. Children teaching each other. So there's a guide in the room. We don't have teachers, we have guides. We have an adult who sets challenges and holds boundaries, but the real teaching and learning is peer to peer. And then we injected the very old Socrates. So this idea that asking questions is far more powerful than delivering answers. So the idea is the adults in an Acton Academy never answer questions. The children learn how to figure things out on their own and together. So instead of being fed information, they have to seek information. They have to ask better and better questions of each other and themselves and learn how to be resourceful to learn how to learn for the rest of their lives. And then we injected those very old ideas with online learning. So when we started Acton Academy, it's been now over 10 years, mm -hmm. online learning was becoming really powerful. And since that time, it's just become almost, you know, I can't imagine having learning without using Google and without using Khan Academy. Right. So these resources that really push the power to young people. You don't have to have money or the best teacher in the school to learn anything you want to learn in this world. And so that's the power of online learning. But I think the key to the whole Acton Academy idea is the mental framework we use from beginning to end. And that's the hero's journey. So our underlying philosophy really is that every single human is a genius, has that creative potential within. And this, the job of school or of the Acton Academy, the learning journey, is to discover what your inner gifts are and to use them to serve others in the world. That's also the entrepreneurial, frankly. So use your inner gifts. You'll find mentors along the way, mentors and guides. You'll have fellow travelers, but you will also battle monsters. There's no good hero's journey without a big crisis, a monster to battle. Mm -hmm. So we talk about those monsters, even with, you know, five and six year olds, they know those wonderful movies and they, they know they want to be in battle, but the monsters they're battling are the monsters of distraction, you know, trying to be easily distracted. So we talk about fighting that monster. We talk about fighting the monster of resistance when you're afraid to start something because it's really, really hard. How do you battle that monster? And the, probably the, the biggest monster of all is the monster of victimhood. This right. idea that the world is against me rather than I'm in charge of making the decisions and creating the world I want. So that's the idea that the children at Acton Academy believe that they're heroes on a journey. They're finding their inner gifts and they're going to solve big problems in the world. So that's the big why that binds the whole thing together. And that's, that's basically the image and the, I mean, the imagery and the feeling of an Acton Academy. 
man, that's, I'm like so mind blown right now. And it just like, it just seems like you're every parent's dream come true, right? These are the things that we really want to instill in our kids. And you just, you labeled that. No, could you just talk a little bit about your story? Cause I just, I'm so curious, like, how did you come up with this? Like, how did you first get the idea? But second, how did you put that into action? Well, the idea came purely accidental. And this, this whole thing is something Jeff, who's my husband, he and I founded this together. It's nothing we ever had a strategic plan for or even intended to do. We just faced a crisis ourselves. So I have two young boys and Jeff has a daughter from a previous marriage. She was in upper elementary school and our boys were three and four years old. They were in a Montessori school and Jeff was Mm -hmm. having conversations with Tate, our daughter's elementary school teacher of when is the best time for our young boys to transition into a more traditional school setting. And this teacher who we admired so much said, oh my gosh, as soon as possible, because once they've been used to freedom and making choices in their lives, it will be really hard for them to sit at a desk and be talked to all day. And Jeff was like, well, wow, it really shocked him. He came home that day and looked at me and said, Laura, we're not doing this anymore. And I said, we're not doing what anymore? And he said, we're not doing the school thing anymore. We're either going to homeschool (laughs) these boys or we're going to create our own school. And I thought, there's no way I could homeschool. I think that's a challenge I couldn't take on. I couldn't be my children's mom and coach and teacher. But I felt like I could build a community. And I really wanted a small community to do this together. So we literally just started pulling things we knew that worked well. And then we started experimenting every day. So Jeff's background was in entrepreneurship education. He has a school of business that's based on the case method. Harvard's based on the case method too. Hmm. That's basically using real world scenarios. The teachers only ask questions. So we knew we wanted that whole question, the Socratic method woven in. We also really believed in technology. That was hot. And we knew we wanted our young boys to be free to learn at their own pace and with the world-class resources that were at our fingertips. That's what technology brought to us. And then we really loved the Montessori mindset and foundational beliefs that children Mm -hmm. need choices in their work, but they also need clear boundaries. So we literally just started experimenting and pulling these things together. We knew it. We wanted it to be hands-on. We knew we wanted it to be feel like a game, you know, to be very game oriented because kids need to have fun to learn. But we also believe that boundaries and being accountable to your decisions is also really important for children to learn. So there are some misconceptions about acting. Some people think it's just kids, you know, playing all day and hanging (laughs) off of the trees and no one holds them accountable or gives them instructions. It's actually a really uh, a well-bound community with contracts and rules that the children make but they also hold themselves accountable to. So there's a strict schedule in the day and there's rules that they abide by, but the difference is they own it. And that's what we really wanted. So we're constantly still experimenting with this idea. And it's not a utopia. That's another thing I really want to put out there. We don't feel like we have all the answers. We really believe we can trust children to help us though. And they're the ones that lead the way. When something's not working, We can turn on a dime and figure out what we're doing wrong and change it. So it's that freedom of the entrepreneurial experience where you really feel like you can be constantly improving, serving the need of the people you're really serving and be responsive to them. So that's how it started. But we continually, even today, I mean, we could stay up all night long talking about what we could do better because (laughs) we really, every day, new problems arise and we're constantly trying to figure out what we should be doing. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, you obviously, you've been doing this for 10 years, so there's got to be a lot of data out there. I just had a few quick questions that I know I'm curious about. How many Acton schools are there currently around the country and around the world? Yes, there are currently 254, and they're all over the world. So we have them in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, Canada, South America, Central America, North America. We have two criteria for people to start their own actins. So the whole idea is these are micro schools that just can Mm -hmm. pop up. They're very micro based in a community. So parents who are also entrepreneurial 
can start one for their own children. And people just find this. They kind of like you were just Googling around, right. looking for ideas in education. Acton often pops up when parents are Googling, you know, new learning environments. How would I start my own school? And we have a simple process for people to go through if they want to start one. So every week we're approving new Actons around the world. And we have conferences. Um, we're having one in March where all the owners from around the world come to Austin, which is where we're based, and we share ideas and we collaborate. So what's happened, which is pretty magical and we never expected, is we have this network around the world of like-minded parents who are creating these micro schools for their own children. So they're taking what we started and making it better every day. That's what's wonderful is Jeff and I are no longer the experts. The owners around the world really are taking it and making it better through experimentation. And then we collaborate on it and we try it again. And that's been really exciting to be a part of. Absolutely. Now, what are the age ranges in, in Acton School? Yes. So we now, we used to just start at first grade, first grade through 12th grade. Okay. But what the new owners started creating is a younger program, preschool program. So now we have a three to six-year-old studio. We don't have classrooms. We call them studios. Hmm. So there's a SPARK program, which is the pre-K program. So your three-year-old would be eligible for that. And then we have elementary studios, middle school studios, and high school studios, which we call Launchpad. The mascot they chose was Eagles, so I suddenly <laughs> start calling them Eagles. But the Eagles wanted a new name for their high school because they knew it would be not a typical high school. So they, right. they renamed it Launchpad because they're launching into the world. I love that. Now, you know, and I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in what you're talking about, mixing the age groups. My daughter's three, and we've had her in an in-home daycare since she was, I mean, almost basically born. And most, she's always been the youngest. And she's, you know, two years ahead of her time easily. And it's just, it's so fascinating to see. But I'm really curious as to like your perspective. So, and let's just say we were to dive into an acting school, like how would it serve like the oldest child in the class? Like how are they still challenged or is it, are they have more of a mentoring role in the school? I'm just curious as to like how it serves the oldest as well as the youngest. That's a really interesting question. I'm glad you asked it because I don't think anyone's asked me that before. But the most powerful thing is about peer learning. First of all, the online learning is self-paced. So all the core skills, half of the day is basically independent learning. Mm -hmm. You're working with your online programs that are all personalized to where you are in learning. You spend half the day doing that. So age doesn't matter in terms of that. Everyone's gotcha. at their own place for whether it's grammar or reading, writing, math, and they work hard at their own pace. They set their own goals and they get instantaneous feedback from these programs and they have dashboards that you know analyze where they are and how they're doing. So that's half of the day. The second half of the day is collaborative hands-on quests. We call our projects quests because they're multi-week projects that have a world a real world problem to solve that then they go out in the world and, and exhibit and show. So it's not just doing a project in a classroom. It's doing this longer term project, basically. Now, what happens is, and this has been really fascinating to watch, your right. age doesn't really determine what you can do. So we may have a nine-year-old who really is astutely skilled in some chemistry concepts mm -hmm. that actually ends up being a leader of the older children doing a, a chemistry and cooking quest, for example, the older students end up being, like you mentioned the word mentor, they end up pulling some of the younger ones forward, teaching them how to collaborate. The idea of working in teams actually is one of the more profound skills these young people leave and act in with, how to work with other people when they're difficult because there are difficult people in the world, right. um, how to solve problems together. So the ages, it just kind of fluctuates who's good at what and who's being a leader in a different skill. And the bar just keeps being raised. So my son right now is a senior. He's about to go to college and he has been doing flight school. Yesterday, he just finished his private pilot's license. So now he can take passengers in the sky. Wow. They, as they get older, they end up doing really big things in the world that they're personally passionate about. So there's an element of our program I haven't mentioned yet that probably answers more of the older student question 
that I've done. And that's the idea of apprenticeships. So starting in middle school, these young people start analyzing what their interests are and and finding mentors and leaders in the community in that field. And they go off and part of their learning plan, part of their, basically their requirements for being in Acton is having an apprenticeship every year from middle school through high school. Those continue to just elevate the skill level and the interest base of those young people. So by the time you're getting older, you're accumulating these real world experiences. Your writing, your reading ends up being at a level that's really high based on that work. So you may be 13 years old, but not be the best in biology or art or math, right. but you're working with people who are. So your, your level is getting higher and higher. And when you're at the highest level, you're still being challenged because you're working at high levels out in the community. Does that make sense? Did I explain Man, that? that? Oh my gosh, that totally, totally makes sense. And okay, good. So, so you obviously, you know, we have, you have 10 years worth of data now. Can you just talk a little bit about like, what are some of the results that you've seen in 10 years of doing this? Yes. So we have the basic data that all schools have because we do standardized tests. We wanted a baseline to make sure nothing was falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. We don't give a huge amount of importance to to this, but it's kind of an interesting metric and the world understands it. So we, we give a standardized test, um, the Stanford 10 test and the Iowa test every year. What we have found is that in nine month period, I'm sorry, yeah, a nine month period on average, our students progress two and a half grade levels compared to their peers. So wow. they're progressing quickly on that standardized test. That's just, to me, that's the power of online learning. They can work at their own pace. And frankly, kids can work really, really hard when they get to choose the work they're doing and they get to work at their own pace. So that's been really exciting to see. And that's just kind of a standard across the board. Now it might, you know, kids can plateau now and then, you know, learning is hard. So some, mm -hmm. some years a child will just stay at grade level. The next year they'll jump three grade levels. So that, but that's a metric we feel solid about. What I really find interesting, the big challenge I thought would be, will colleges accept our students? Will the work be translatable into a traditional transcript that universities interpret and can see is worthy? And sure enough, three years ago, we graduated, our campus graduated its first seniors. Other campuses had, had already graduated seniors into the world. And they got accepted into every university they applied to and ended up, there were just two seniors in our first class that went to college. One got a job in the tech world and didn't need to go to college. So that was interesting. But they together were offered over, I think, half a million dollars for scholarships. I mean, the universities wanted these people. They're writing is fine. They can collaborate well with others. They're very well spoken. I think that's the power of the Socratic method. From age five and six up, every day, twice a day, they're having intensive Socratic discussions with each other. So by the time they're in middle school and high school, these young people can speak and communicate and persuade. They've opened a couple businesses during their time at Acton. Entrepreneurship and the Children's Business Fair is a big part of what we do. So these young people can take tests and do well right. on tests. But even more importantly, they can write, they can communicate, they can work with others. And, and this was most important to me as a mom, they know what they want to do. They know what their interests are. They're not going out into the world kind of oblivious and hoping someone will help them find their way. They have a very specific path they want to follow because they've honed it for years and met with mentor after mentor after mentor over the years. And they're very purposeful in the path that they want after high school. And those are the things that to me, I see with, without a doubt, it's very obvious. One of my favorite metrics though comes from grandparents. I have grandparents <laughs> come up to me at open houses and parent meetings and say, thank you so much. My grandchildren are so much fun to have dinner with now. They are so interesting to talk to. They can talk about anything and they never just sit there. They used to just sit there and not want to talk. And now I want to talk with them and we have the best conversations. So for me, that's very satisfying that they really, they're people who are curious and really love talking with other people. Man, that's, it's like everything you're saying is just like gold to a parent's ears. And I have like a million questions that I want to ask you. And I could just, I mean, I really, I really can see this now that, you know, these children are going to go and interview for Harvard and, you know, the 
the person director of admissions is looking at, you know, their, their little resume and they're like, Oh, you went to Acton. Hey, come on in. You're, <laughs> you're oh. in. We know, we know you know what you're doing. You know, that's just, it's, it's so refreshing to hear that because I, that's the thing that scares me the most, you know, with my children is them not knowing what they want to do. And yeah. I, I joined the Navy because I had no idea what I wanted to do after high school. Like I had no experience. I didn't, I didn't have any mentors. I didn't meet with anybody. I just graduated and everybody was going. I saw what they were spending and, you know, my family didn't have that. And so I figured I would give myself six years to figure it out. But I still, I didn't have a framework in the Navy either, which led me to be more confused when I got out than when I went in on what I wanted to do. And that's why it's just, it's just amazing to hear, you know, what you're building. So, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just, I wondered if you could just take me through or take the audience through a typical day and a typical week, because they're structured a little differently. And I'm really, when we read it, because we found that there was an act in here in Nashville, we were like, whoa, this is really cool. So could you talk about a typical day and then like a typical schedule for a week? Yes, absolutely, because I think it's really important to understand that framework. But first, I want to say something quickly about what you just said. I agree with you so much, and it's kind of like this idea, like, who cares if your kids get good grades if at the end of the day, they don't believe in themselves? Yes. And so as parents, you want them to believe in themselves and not just be quiet and get through a, a system and fly under the radar. They, these young people need to believe in themselves and that's what's going to change the world. So now to the structure of the day, it's very, and the week and the year, we're basically an 11 month school year, which I think is kind of fun and interesting. We have found mm. that the learning just keeps going because we don't take a long three month break in the summer. Right. So we start in September after Labor Day and we go in six week spurts and then take a week or two off. So those six weeks are called a session and there are seven mm. sessions in a school year. And so the session has an arc, just like a, a day has an arc. So in that six weeks, each week is broken down by each day, obviously. The day is broken down. There's two bookends. At the beginning of the day and the end of the day, there's a Socratic discussion, a 15-minute circle time where everyone comes together. The, the morning Socratic discussion launches the day. The closing discussion reflects on the day. So that is the arc, and that happens at the beginning and the end of the session, too. So you're constantly looking forward, but then reflecting back on learning. And I have found that experiential learning means nothing if you don't include reflection time. So that's mm -hmm. really critical. Then the day itself, it's very simple. The morning is, is silent core skills time. This is when each individual sets their own goals, what work they're going to accomplish, they have a laptop and their book and their writing pad and they work independently. It's silent, it's quiet, and they really work hard on holding those boundaries. Then they, and during that time, they do have a, a break. They can go run around outside, have snacks whenever they want. The idea is fuel your body when you need to, move when you need to, but the goal is to learn how to get back and focus quickly and accomplish your goals. So that's the morning, then there's lunchtime, community lunch, and then free time where they go run around. There's tons of play time. Just free open play, I think, is so critical. I believe in it so much. Mm -hmm. And then the afternoon is our quest time. So that's the collaborative hands-on project we talked about. Most of the quests that are broken into teams, they receive their challenges of the day, and then they get to work on those challenges. Whether it's rocket science, they're building rockets, or maybe they're building an electrical grid for a city, or they're a hospital and they have patients coming in and they're trying to diagnose them. So those are the quests, that's the afternoon. And then they close the day with a discussion. Now interspersed within those big chunks, we mm -hmm. have PE and art. So we bring in PE coaches and art coaches. So they get the visual creative arts, they get acting and process drama, and then they, are, they get the experience of being coached by a coach for athletic training. So that's interspersed twice a week. Also twice a week is civilization discussion. So they dive deeply into history, the stories of the world, and intertwined in those are hero stories, the big heroes from civilization from the right. beginning of time. And the big question around those discussions always is, the hero was in a dilemma. What would you have done given those circumstances? And they dive deeply into that question. So that's what the day looks like and the week looks like. And then the session 
ends with a public exhibition where the parents and the community are invited in to see what learning happened. And it could be a debate or it could be an art exhibit or it could be a demonstration of their cooking and chemistry. We've had a shark tank when they present their um, (laughs) pitches for the businesses. So the idea is there's lots of individual time, lots of collaborative time, but there's always that interfacing of the real world, that exhibition. So you feel like you want to get better all the time because people are going to come and look at what you're doing. (laughs) That's the basic approach. Awesome. Now, I, I just have to ask this because, you know, it sounds so amazing. But when you were first starting, can you just spend a minute or two talking about some of the obstacles that you went through? Like, did you run into a lot of skepticism early on from people that are so used to structure and their kids eating at a certain time that they were worried or concerned that freedom would lead to chaos? Like, what, was, what were some of the difficult things that you had to navigate early on? Yes, there were, there were a lot. And there still <laughs> are, frankly. I mean, th- this idea is not a natural idea for parents, frankly. So the biggest problem in the beginning, we started with just seven students, two of them were our own. (laughs) So we just had five others and that kind of magical group of seven was beautiful, but it was really hard to recruit those first families because gosh, we were basically just saying, trust us, we don't know what we're doing, but trust Mm. us. (laughs) But those brave parents joined us and then really word of mouth, People started seeing that children were having fun going to school and wanted to go to school. They didn't want summer to come. And so by word of mouth, people started joining us. But the problem really remains the same. Parents get scared when we don't fix failure because part of this idea is we believe failure is really important and we don't protect children from struggle. So that's really uncomfortable. So we still experience this struggle with parents when their child's having a hard time and we tell them we're not going to fix it. They need to learn how to fix it themselves and we trust them. They're going to be okay. Parents still think that that's too much. I mean, some parents really don't like that. They would rather have a more predictable, something they're used to, a teacher that steps in when their child is struggling, for example, or a way to have a parent meeting where the parent and the teacher decide what to do to help the child we believe children should be in those conversations. So we, we still today struggle with that resistance from parents when things get really hard. So part of my job, frankly, now, I call myself the chief encourager, <laughs> but it's really of parents, right. not the children. The children can do this if we let them. But for parents, it's really, really hard because when our child has a hard time, it hurts us deeply. We don't want to see our child struggle socially or you know, academically. But frankly, what I've seen, that's where the good stuff is. So if I can help support parents, I try to give, I have a blog that I write constantly about struggles I have and how they turned out to try to encourage parents. The book I wrote, Courage to Grow, is really about this, this whole struggle as a family, what it looks like and how it plays out. And we have meetings with parents where we share stories. So the idea is if we can just help each other as parents and realize that children can do far more than we imagine if we just get out of their way, then it makes the journey easier. But frankly, it's not an easy journey. And we still have people who say, no way, I don't want this and leave halfway through the year. So it's, it's, it's not for everybody, but for the people who do believe that struggle is important and that children can do hard things, then this is a really rewarding experience, even for parents who wish it could be more comfortable. Totally. And man, I agree 100%. I mean, just to expand on what you're saying, I have one of my just greatest mentors, great family man, he's built huge companies. And we were having a discussion over dinner, and he said the exact same thing. He's like, you know, it's, it's so sad that, you know, children are programmed that making mistakes are bad. They're punished Mm. for failing. They're punished for making mistakes. And, you know, that leads them to have this, you know, this they're in their subconscious when they get older, they're scared to really attempt things and go all in and struggle. They're afraid of it. And he's like, anybody that's ever built anything great or had success knew that they failed their way to success. And he's like, it's just so unfortunate that they're so terrified of it because they're always punished for making mistakes or somebody will step in and fix it. So I just, I think that's so powerful what you're like, what you're saying. I just have a couple last questions. My next question, and I apologize because a part of me feels like I'm interviewing you as a parent that's about to enroll all of my kids in your school and not not for a podcast. (laughs) 
But it's, these are just the questions that I just, I have. So my next question is, is how, like, do you have any kind of accountability system for all of the franchises? Like, do they have a certain thing that they have to uphold to? I mean, I'm sure you give them the freedom, the flexibility, and you implement the curriculum, but how do you uphold the people that represent Acton that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? Great question. Quality control is really important to us and full transparency as a network is, is very important to us. Mm-hmm. One thing that all owners commit to doing when they sign their contract with us is weekly surveys that we get to see the results of. So every family, every student is given a survey at the end of the week. How did we do on our promises and what could we do to improve? We look at those numbers and we can see they're, they're usually we all share the same problems. It's, you know, it's just, so we see the results we share and we talk them through with the owners. That's probably the most important quality control we have because we get to hear from the parents and also from the Eagles. And that's really important. We also get together often with new owners. And so we have a, a forum, a Google forum that we're constantly sharing and giving feedback to each other. We're in tight communication with these actants. It feels like a tightly knit community, almost a support group. So right. no one can fly under the radar and open an Acton Academy. There have been two situations where we found an actant slide into traditional teaching it was easy to see immediately. And we, we said to them, you're wonderful people. You just can't use our name anymore. So they, they changed their school, changed the name. They were more comfortable having teachers and giving instructions and lectures. Right. That's not Acton. And so as much as we think they're good people, we took our name away. And that's just happened twice. So that's, that's really through constant communication and the surveys, we really can check in with each other. We also do visits and we have a checklist you know it's an act and when. And there's certain things in every act and studio that you must see in order for it to be an act and academy. And it's things like the map of the hero's journey, tracking of goals that you can see, a contract signed by the children, the rules of engagement posted, a map of a quest. And so those are things that you could walk into any, in fact, our act and academy in Pakistan, I follow them on Instagram and it looks exactly like our act. I mean, the things they do, the way they sit in their circle times. So there's certain things that now that it's been going on for a while, we all do and it all feels and looks like an act. And that's becoming more and more systematic. That's awesome. The last thing I wanted to ask is if you could just take a minute, all the parents that are listening to this podcast from just all of the thousands of children that you've been a part of developing what advice would you give to parents? Because I, we all fall in the same boat, right? We, we shelter our kids or we're just overbearing sometimes. Like, could you just take a minute and give all of the parents listening some advice, having done what you've done, having built what you've built on just, just some parental advice on how to help their kids grow and nurture. Maybe they live in a city where there isn't an act in currently. You know, what advice would you give them? I have three things that I have found If a parent does, it really equips the children in that family to live a hero's journey. Number one, stop answering so many questions. It is an amazing transformation when you say, hmm, I bet you can figure that out. We tend to fall into a trap as parents and it's exhausting. You know, they ask us a million questions every day. Just stop answering and then, hmm, I wonder what you'll do. Ooh, I can't wait to see how you'll figure that out or give them choices. You can either do, you know, this or that. So stop answering questions. Secondly, tell hero stories, whether it's watching those classics, you know, Lion King and Nemo and Hercules or, you know, read the stories, the, the classic hero stories always have a hero who fails or fights a monster, but they don't quit. They get back in the game. The more often a child hears these stories of real humans and mythical humans and creatures getting into trouble with their lives, getting into challenges, getting into a deep cave or facing a dragon, but they keep going, that's going to fuel them. They'll have this bank of memories and stories to draw from when they too face a cave or a a monster in their life. So Mm. don't answer questions. Tell lots of great stories where the hero gets back up. And thirdly, this may sound strange, but let them scrub toilets. Let them do real work. Let them know that being a human involves rolling up your sleeves and getting dirty and doing work. 
Don't be afraid to give them jobs. I think it's so rewarding to have real work and to feel satisfied that you can keep your space clean. Those are very simple things, but at the end of every day, one thing I didn't mention in the daily schedule, there, mm-hmm. there's 15 minutes called studio maintenance. We literally have at every act in the young people break down the chores of the day, and in 15 minutes, they get the job done. They literally scrub the toilets. They spray down all the tables. They vacuum. There's a vacuum in the supply closet of every Acton Academy. They take the trash out. They separate the recycling. In 15 minutes, you can get it done when you're organized and you split up the jobs. Well, families should do that too. So that's, that's all I say is just be real have real work. Don't be afraid to step back and let them figure out their own problems. And you'll end up really having a blast as a parent. Laura, this has been one of the greatest interviews I've ever had. I can't thank you enough. I I, I just, I already know the feedback that I'm going to get from the people listening. And I just, I think what you're doing is one of the greatest things that anybody could do. And I, I have no doubt that there will be actins all over the planet. I mean, everywhere, in every city, in, in no time. The last thing is if you could just let everybody that's listening know just the best way to connect with you, find you, maybe they want to open up an actin. Like what's the best way to get in touch or to follow your work and what you're doing? Yes. Literally, if you just Google Acton Academy, our website will pop up. There's a button on there, launch my own. You can explore our videos, our resources. The website is rich for people to learn more. Hmm. My book, Courage to Grow, there's a link at the website, but also it's on Amazon. Or I'd love to connect through my blog site if anyone's interested in reading just tips about this parent to parent. It's actinacademyparents.com. So any of those resources, I'd love to connect. I'd love to hear stories and share stories. I just think being a parent is the hardest thing in the world, but also can be the most exciting journey. Absolutely. Laura, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for sharing your wisdom with the audience today. I've had fun. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Boom. I really hope you guys like that episode and definitely follow Laura, follow the Acton Mission. They're all over the internet, so they are definitely not hard to find. I personally just get so excited when I see people around the world just doing really cool things and learning from their stories. And on that note, if you, yes, you listeners, if you or anyone you know has a really amazing story, I would love to hear from you. Obviously, I have to be a little picky on who I bring on the show so that I don't cover redundant topics or something that's just really over talked about. But I want you to know that I'm always looking for people doing really crazy, interesting things. The best way to connect with me or to contact me right now is through Instagram at Mentor Nation Podcast. Just jump on Instagram. Again, it's at Mentor Nation Podcast. Shoot me a message if you know someone with a really unique story that has accomplished something really, really, really cool or it's just doing something really, really interesting. I would love to hear from you. I really hope you guys are ready because the next few episodes have already been recorded and I can't even contain my excitement knowing that I'm going to release them really, really, really soon. Make sure you tune in next week. And as always, thank you so much for your time and attention. It means a lot. Have a great week. Have a great week.